what is the connection between love and forgiveness? We're turning to Luke chapter 7 this morning. And the events of today's text take place right after the events of last week's text. Last week, Jesus spent much time talking about the significance of the ministry of John the Baptist. But you see already in that text, he's transitioning the focus toward himself. When we come to verse 36, concluding Jesus' time of teaching, and we see, with the conversation ending, one of the Pharisees, who had been present hearing Jesus, decides to take Jesus to a more private location. Not completely private, as we will see. But look with me in verse 36 here of Luke chapter 7, and I'm going to go ahead and begin reading. One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil, and stood at his feet behind him, weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her tears, and wiped them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. As we look at these opening verses, who is our attention drawn to? Who becomes immediately the main character of this text? Who is it? It's this woman that comes onto the scene. Apparently, this was a meal that was not pri that was not a private occasion completely between the Pharisee and Jesus. We'll see that there are actually a number of other diners with them at the end of the text. We also see that there is nothing unusual about this woman entering the, the Pharisee's house during this public meeting. Because there's no expression of surprise that she's there. Which means that these doors were open for other people to come and at least observe the events that were taking place. Maybe they wouldn't sit at the dinner table, but they could sit around the outside, maybe listen to the conversation of this well-known teacher, Jesus, these Pharisees that were there. So there was no surprise expressed at her coming into the house. So it's not her presence in the Pharisee's house that the gospel writer Luke draws our attention to. What our attention is drawn to are the details about the woman herself. What kind of woman is this? That she's a, that's how she's described as, right? She's described as a sinner. Now, that may not strike you as significant because we might think, well, are, are we all sinners, right? I'm a sinner. Are, are any of you sinners? I think we say yes. But Luke draws attention to this detail in a way that sets her apart from the rest of us normal sinners. The Greek text reads, Behold, a woman who was being in the city a sinner. And you also see the judgmental thoughts of the Pharisee in verse 39, which help us understand that this is not just an ordinary, regular sinner like the rest of us. Because he says, this man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this is. She is a sinner. In other words, this woman had a reputation in the city in connection with a specific sin or a specific variety of sins. It's quite possible that she was known in the city as an immoral woman. Many people speculate that she was possibly even a prostitute. And if you grew up in a relatively small town where you knew everybody, 
you learn to pick up these kinds of people pretty quickly, right? There's the town drunk. There's the town cheat. Not, not you, <laughs> You're just right there, I'm sorry. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying. There's the town drunk, the town cheat. There's the town prostitute. You knew who these people were. You could pick them out because it was a small town. And everybody knew who these people were. Everybody knew who this woman was. And Luke intends this to be a very hardcore introduction to this woman who shows up at this public event. Here and there, there are probably other townspeople who desire to listen to Jesus as he reclines at dinner with the Pharisee. But then she comes in. And when people see her, everyone knows who she is. Her simple reputation is common knowledge. But the next thing that the gospel writer wants to draw our attention to is not only who she is, what else does Luke draw our attention to? He draws our attention to what she does. In fact, Luke goes into rather lengthy detail about the actions of of this woman who had a sinful reputation. What does this woman do? She does a number of things, as we will see. What does she do? First of all, we see that she had been searching for Jesus. Verse 37 says that she learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, so she came there. In other words, this was not a chance encounter. This was not random. This was not coincidence that she happened to bump into Jesus. This woman had been trying to find Jesus. She knew who he was. She wanted to find out where he was. And when she learned where he was, she came prepared. Because what did she come into the house carrying? She was carrying something special, wasn't she? She came into the house carrying a container of precious, fragrant perfume or oil, as our text says. Verse 38 says that she stands behind Jesus at his feet. Now you might ask yourself, how is, she, how is it possible to do that at the same time? How can you stand behind Jesus and also stand at his feet? I mean, you have to realize that people were not sitting on chairs in this day. In this oriental uh, culture, they would actually recline at table on these low-lying couches. And so Jesus would have been propped upon his elbow on a couch, eating with one hand, and his feet would be sticking out behind him. Like many of you like to go home after Sunday and go take a nap on the couch. And so Jesus would have been lying there, and this woman would have been standing behind him as he's lying on his side at his feet, and as she stands there at Jesus' feet, behind Jesus, she begins to weep. And her tears coursing down her face begin to wet the feet of Jesus. The word translated to wet here is also seen in Matthew 5.45, where scripture speaks of how God sends rain on the just and the unjust. It appears that she is not concerned about her tears wetting the feet of Jesus. In fact, since she is crying, it seems that she intentionally causes her tears to fall all the more on Jesus' feet. And with Jesus' feet now being wet with her tears, she takes in hand the hairs of her head, kneels to the ground, and begins wiping her own tears all over Jesus' feet with her own hands. And then she begins kissing his feet. And in between her kisses, she begins pouring that precious, fragrant perfume on the feet of Jesus. What a picture. I mean, do you capture that in your mind, what she's doing? That's a pretty vivid picture. 
So what in the world is going on here? Because I think you recognize this conduct is not normal conduct by a person. And to some who were present at the dinner, including the host, the behavior of this woman, because of her sinful reputation, was downright detestable. You see the response of the Pharisee to what he sees. He sees this woman treating Jesus in this way, being so just open and free about her emotion and her action toward Jesus. And what does he think in himself? What does he say to himself in verse 39? He says, this man, if he were a prophet, right, he's, just, he's just being very blunt, right? He's being very pharisaical. This is him at his core. He's not hiding anything. This man, if he were a prophet, right, if Jesus were a prophet, he would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. You can sense the revulsion of this man's words toward this woman. He views this woman as if she will contaminate Anything that she touches, including this teacher, Jesus. And the words we read here are a true reflection of the Pharisee's heart. This woman is a known sinner. And this Jesus supposedly is a prophet. But if Jesus really were a prophet, he would recoil at the woman's touch because of how sinful she is. Because I know that's what I would do. And the truth is, and we must not deny this fact, this woman was a very sinful woman. There is no question about that. This Pharisee is not incorrect about the sinful reputation that she has. But what he concludes about Jesus, on the other hand, is completely incorrect. Jesus knows exactly who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him. And Jesus is about to inform this Pharisee exactly what this woman is communicating through her very unusual and highly emotional actions. Look with me in verse 40. You see Jesus confronting Simon about the thoughts he is having in his heart. Or the words he's speaking under his breath, whichever one it is. Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, that's his name, I have something to say to you. So he said, teacher, say it. You know, being respectful, using Jesus' uh, title there. Jesus says, there was a certain creditor, lender, who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii, the other 50. And when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, you have rightly judged. Now, when Jesus tells Simon the Pharisee what he does, he uses a simple and to the point, parable. Right? And you know what a parable is. Essentially, it's a story that intends to teach something. There's a creditor in this parable, a lender, who loaned out money to two different people. And one of these people owes 500 denarii, and the other owes 50 denarii. Now you understand, a denarius was essentially a day's wage for a laborer or a soldier. So one man owes about a year and a half worth of payments to this lender. It would take about that long for him to work off. And the other person owes about two months worth of payment. The day comes for these debtors to repay their debts, and they are not able to repay it. What would typically happen if you could not repay your debts? Well, you get thrown into prison until you've paid every last penny. I don't know how you do that. 
Maybe your family would have to take up the bill. But instead of having these two debtors punished, as the lender was well within his rights to do, he actually does what is unexpected and totally undeserved. He forgives both of these men their debts. Payment of the debt is no longer required from either of them. The debts of these men, both the larger debt and the smaller debt, have both been canceled. The payments that they owed both have been forgiven, regardless of how different they were. But notice with me, how does Jesus end his parable? Jesus ends it with a question, doesn't he? And what is this question intended to do? This question is intended to bring Simon the Pharisee face to face with the significance of what has happened in the dining room of his own house. What is the question that Jesus asks at the end of verse 42? He asks, tell me, therefore, which of the debtors will love the creditor more? I don't know if Simon understands the significance of Jesus' question yet, but the answer, even to this Pharisee, is fairly obvious, isn't it? Which one will love the creditor more? The debtor that will love the creditor more, Simon responds, is the one whom the creditor forgave the more. Makes sense, doesn't it? Wouldn't that be the case if it were you? But then Jesus does something. He actually calls the attention to the woman. Right? The Pharisee would rather not call attention to the woman. He'd rather say, woman, get out of here. But that's not what Jesus does. Jesus actually physically, whether he rolls over on the couch and looks at the woman, he turns to the woman and says to Simon, do you see this woman? Because she's going to be the object lesson here. Simon saw the woman all right, but he didn't see what Jesus saw. Where Simon sees a woman full of wickedness, unworthy even to touch the likes of Jesus, Jesus sees a woman full of love. A love, by the way, which is absent in Simon. What does Jesus say to Simon? He says, do you see this woman? I entered your house, Simon. This was your opportunity to be the host, to show honor to your guest. But how did Simon make use of his opportunity to fulfill his role as the host? He didn't. Jesus goes on to say, you gave me no feet or no water for my feet. A good host would have provided water for his visitor back in those days without paved roads. To wash the dust and the grime of the day from his feet before the meal. More well-to-do homes would actually have a servant assigned to this task of washing the feet of the visitor. But Simon had done nothing to provide for Jesus in this way. Jesus goes on in verse 45. You gave me no kiss. Verse 46. You did not anoint my head with oil. And again, these are the kinds of hospitable actions that a good host would have done for someone that he had invited into his house. A kiss upon Jesus' cheek. Some oil for Jesus' head. These actions of hospitality would have been appropriate for Simon to show toward Jesus, especially given how the people held Jesus in such high esteem. But beyond the invitation to dinner, 
which really didn't require much. Simon had done nothing to show Jesus honor. He had done nothing that would have communicated any sort of love or any sort of affection that he had in his heart for Jesus. But what about this woman with a sinful reputation? Do you see this woman? You, Simon, gave me the water for my feet. But what has she done? She has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You, Simon, gave me no kiss, but she has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head, Simon, with oil, the cheap olive oil, which was freely accessible. But she has anointed my feet with fragrant perfume. This woman has gone beyond the duties expected of the host in utter humility and complete disregard for what others might think about her. And then to Simon, and now to all of us reading this morning, Jesus explains why this woman has done such humbling and self-abasing actions for Jesus. Look with me in verse 47. Jesus says, Therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, right? We do not deny that. But they are forgiven, for she loved much. Let's make sure we understand what Jesus is saying here. Because he wants us to make sure we understand what he is saying here. This affection. And all of these self-abasing actions that this sinful woman has shown to Jesus are responses of love to Jesus for something that has happened in her life because of Jesus. There is no denying the sinful past of this woman that she has lived. But from what Jesus is saying... This woman is revealing by the love she has shown toward Jesus that the many sins of her past have been forgiven. She has repented of her sins. She has turned from her sins and she has been forgiven of her sins. The burden of those many sins has been lifted. The debt of her many sins has been canceled. She has been set free from all those sins. And her response to the only one through whom freedom from sin is possible is to pour out the full, unrestrained expression of her gratitude and love. Her love toward Jesus is great because the sins that had been forgiven her were great. But they had been forgiven. But what about this Pharisee, Simon? Simon may not have committed the vast amount of sin that this woman had. In fact, the parable would lend us to conclude that. His sins may well have been relatively few by comparison. And certainly this was something that he took a significant amount of pride in, didn't he? Like the Pharisee that we'll find in Luke 18, who stands there saying, Lord, thank you that I'm not like this tax collector. And his attitude of moral superiority is clearly seen back in verse 39. He was a law-keeping righteous Pharisee whose sins were far, far fewer and less heinous than the sins of this woman. But what is the comparison that Jesus makes between this woman and Simon? 
It's not about whose sins are more. Yes, this woman had committed far more sins than this Pharisee. That's just common knowledge. But the comparison that Jesus confronts this Pharisee with not, uh, is not which of them is more sinful than the other. The critical question is, which of them, this Pharisee or the sinful woman, has been forgiven their sin? That's the comparison of importance. Because one sin is all that it takes to separate you from holy God for all eternity. It doesn't matter if it's one sin, if it's ten sins, a hundred sins, or a million sins. Any amount of sin is enough to condemn you to face the wrath of God in the lake of fire which burns forever. This woman was a sinful woman who had given herself to a lifestyle of sin so grievously that her sinful reputation was known to everyone. And because of her many, many sins, she deserved to face eternal penalty for her sin. She did. But even the most wretched and vile of sinners can have their sins forgiven. And it is clear from her astounding display of love for Jesus that her sins, as many as they were, had indeed been forgiven. But what does the love of Simon toward Jesus reveal to us about his sins. Jesus does not point to Simon directly in the words that he says, but the words Jesus says at the end of verse 47 are fully intended to stand as a rebuke towards Simon. He says, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. The parable that Jesus had shared in verses 41 through 42 had its real life counterparts, didn't it? Who was the creditor representing? The lender. Who is that representing in the parable? Jesus, God, right? Who is the one who has been forgiven the greater amount? Well, it's the woman, the sinful woman. And we would expect. The one who was forgiven the lesser amount to be whom? Simon, the Pharisee. Except there's one significant problem. What love did Simon show to Jesus? You want to know what the answer is? Zero. What is it that Jesus had just said in verses 44 through 46? You, Simon, did not give me any water for my feet. You, Simon, did not give me a kiss. You, Simon, did not put oil on my head. Simon, you did not show me any love. My friend, what does the absence of a love for Jesus reveal about one's sin? And this is the crux of this text. What does the absence of a love for Jesus reveal about one's sin? If there is no love for Jesus, then your sins have not been forgiven. Do you see that? Is that what this text is teaching? If there is no love for Jesus in your life, then your sins have not been forgiven. It doesn't matter how much fewer your sins are compared to someone else. That's what Simon was doing. He was comparing himself with this clearly sinful woman with a very sinful past. It doesn't matter if you sinned once in your life, 
and your neighbor has sinned a million times were the worst kinds of sin. The fact is, if your neighbor has been forgiven of his one million sins and you have not been forgiven your one, your neighbor, forgiven of all his sins, will spend eternity with God. And you, with your one unforgiven sin, will spend eternity in hell. That's it. Doesn't matter how many your sins are. The question is, have they been forgiven by God? The abundant love of this woman toward Jesus revealed the reality of a forgiven life. The sins that had defined her the sinful reputation that had been identified with her. People saw her and said, sinner, sinner, sinner. That cloud had hung over her for years. All of that had been relegated to the past. She had been made a new person through the forgiveness of her sins. And her love for Jesus confirmed that she had indeed been forgiven. So as far as Jesus was concerned, this woman was not the sinner that she used to be. She had been cleansed. She had been forgiven. She, Jesus knew the transformation that had taken place in her heart. So what he says next isn't so much for her benefit, though I am sure his words filled this woman with all the more love and devotion toward him. What he says next is for the others who are also present, including Simon. Because you see Jesus saying to her in verse 48, your sins are forgiven. The Greek literally says your sins have been forgiven. And then here comes the response from everyone else. Those who sat at the table with him began to say to themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? This might ring a bell. If you remember back to Luke chapter 5, these exact words were used, weren't they? And these words were used when Jesus speaks to a paralytic whose friends had lowered him to Jesus through a hole in the roof to be healed. The response of the Pharisees then was similar to the response of the diners in the home of Simon the Pharisee now. There is only one who has the authority to forgive sins, isn't there? I can't forgive sin. You can't forgive sin. Who alone has that authority? God does. No mere man possesses that authority. But as we're continuing to see unfold, as we make our way through Luke's gospel... Jesus is no mere man, is he? Far from it. And having proclaimed the forgiveness of this woman, Jesus concludes with one final but important statement to this woman whose sins have been forgiven. He says to the woman in verse 50, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. My friend, this woman believed in Jesus. This woman believed the message that Jesus had come to proclaim. This woman believed that the forgiveness of her many, many sins was possible only through someone greater than, his, than herself. There was no way that this woman could ever erase the debt of her sin. No amount of good works could cancel out any of her bad. Alone, she was destined to perish. For all eternity. The payment that she deserved was death. And she could not save herself. And my friend, neither could you. But when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, the eternal debt of your sin was canceled. The eternal price that you owed to a holy God was forgiven you. 
And Jesus was the one who paid it all in his own body on the tree. And this woman, the sinner, knew what it was to be completely forgiven. She knew what it was to be set free from her sin. And because she had placed her faith not in herself, not in her own abilities, not in her own goodness, because she had none, but because she placed her faith in God who justifies the ungodly and in Jesus Christ whom he had sent, she was forgiven. And the reality of the forgiveness of the many, many sins of this woman resulted in her great, great love, which she showed to the one who had forgiven. So let me ask you this question. What does your love for Jesus tell you about the state of your sin? Does your love for Jesus reveal that your sins have been forgiven? Or is the love for Jesus absent in your life? And the words of Jesus are true. Someone who has been forgiven many sins will feel the freedom that Jesus brings more keenly, won't they? The love that person shows for Christ is going to be far greater following his salvation than the love of someone who was, who was saved as a young child. I know when I was a young boy, and I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior, I loved Jesus, but not like someone who was saved from a lifestyle of sin. Not like someone who was saved from alcoholism and drug abuse and immorality and pornography. That person, when he is delivered from his sin, looks to Jesus and says, Wow! This is what you have done for me. You freed me from all of this. I no longer have to live in it. I have the power through Jesus Christ to say no. That's love. But every one of us need the forgiveness that Jesus offers. Even if our forgiveness is only for a relatively few amount of sins. Because woe be to you if you pass into eternity with those relatively few sins unforgiven. Because just one sin is enough to damn you for all eternity. All sin is sin against a holy, righteous God, and all sin will be dealt with if it is not forgiven by Jesus himself. But if your sins have indeed been forgiven, my friend, there will be in your heart and in your life a love for Jesus that was not there before. Your love for Jesus will be demonstrated by keeping his commandments. Right? That's what Jesus says. If you love me, keep my commandments. Your love for Jesus will be demonstrated by the love that you show for other followers of Jesus. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Your love for Jesus will be demonstrated by a love for God's word. So friend, as you examine your life, and I pray that you will do when you go home. Do you see in your life the love for Jesus that must be present in one whose sins have been forgiven? Is that love there? Do you see it in your life? Do you see it growing and increasing? Do you see a growing love for other Christians? Do you see a growing love for obeying God's word? Is that love for Jesus there? Or does the absence of a love for Jesus reveal that your sins, regardless of how many, remain between you and God? May the love of Christ dwell richly in we who have been forgiven. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your truth today. Lord, I pray that we who have been forgiven in this room today 
would not only love you, but that we would grow in that love for you. That we would always be seeking more and more ways to demonstrate that love that we have for you because of what you have done for us. Lord, there are some in this room who have been forgiven many, many sins and perhaps even grievous sins. And they can come before you today and say, God, thank you for what you have done. There are others in this room who have been saved from their sin. They have been forgiven of their sin, even though those sins have been relatively few and not as grievous. But Lord, the key is, have our sins been forgiven? And I pray that each one in this room would able to, with, with great confidence, say yes. And may our love display the reality of that forgiveness. God, we ask your blessing on your word today. In Jesus' name, amen.